My name is John Vachon. I can tell a lot about a man by the way he holds a toothpick in his mouth. The twitchy back and forth, the quiet spike set in the corner, the sucking and poking of the pick held with the fingers. These are the types of men, the nervous and insecure, the sinister and untrustworthy, and the conventional man, fresh from rotary. You'd think this trivial knowledge would be great material for a wannabe writer, but it didn't work out that way. It all started in my early 20s. Smack dab in the middle of the Great Depression, the dean kicked me out of grad school on my drunken ass with no masters and no prospects. But in June 1936, I caught a break. Through some neat little patronage string pulling, I got a job at the historical section of Farm Security Administration, working for the guy in charge named Roy Stryker. I started out as an assistant and messenger boy, but Mr. Stryker saw I had some smarts and promoted me to file the photos into this huge collection taken by his photographers. Here's the way it worked. The photographers in the field sent in their film to the D.C. lab. We returned a contact sheet of the negatives back to them, and they wrote captions. All I had to do was ID the photographers and pencil their captions on the back of the final prints. That's me on the left, with photographers Arthur Rothstein, Russell Lee, and with Mr. Stryker on the far right. These photos came from all over the U.S. They showed life during the Great Depression and how government programs were helping needy citizens. I had trouble keeping up with the workload, because some of these photos brought me to tears. I would stop and stare into the helpless eyes of the kids but the desperate faces on the adults really scared me. If I didn't start behaving like a grown-up instead of a drunken college boy, I too would be on the bread lines. But I could feel myself changing. Maybe I wasn't supposed to write about people. Maybe I was supposed to make their portraits. Maybe I was an artist. The only way to find out was to start shooting with a camera. I knew I had an eye for people, I just didn't know if I could put what I saw onto film. After I leaned on Stryker to borrow a camera in 1937, he turned me loose to roam the streets of D.C. He'd evaluate my work and we'd go from there. I felt pretty cocky. After all, I'd seen thousands of photographs from the best men and women in Stryker's stable. Guys like Walker Evans were my hero. But out on the streets, with a camera around my neck, doubt overwhelmed me. Could I do this? Could I be as good as the others? Did I have any meaningful future at all? I felt stupid. I could not move. But I sucked in some morning air, blinked into the sunrise, and forced my legs to walk. Turning away from the marbled offices, I edged deeper into the city's squalor. About an hour later, I forgot about myself and started to look around. I forgot about Stryker. I forgot about my future as some kind of artist. I began to see people. Two kids in front of a grocery store, their eyes wide with despair and hunger. A blind man holding out his hat in front of a bank. An optimistic poster of capital and labor shaking hands. Black men waiting outside the home where Lincoln died. On that stroll around D.C., I guess you'd say I caught a restless fever. I had to get on the road like Stryker's other men. And what did I do? In 1938, I got married and left my pretty wife Penny at home to fend for herself. Oh, I'd send her money and promise letters, but parting at the train station was teary and made me feel like a goddamn heel. A graduate of Oberlin College and a talented pianist, Penny was a real gem. She didn't deserve what she got from me. Watching from the train as Maryland and Pennsylvania darkened, I felt grief and exhilaration. Yeah, I was now on my own grand little adventure. But what had I left behind? Very likely a wife and an unborn child. When I woke and when I lay down, my thoughts were of Penny and that child. So you see, even before I snapped my first photograph, I felt the shame of failure. I worried I would carry that feeling the rest of my life. On the night train, rolling west, I started my first letter to Penny.
Before he let us go on the road, Stryker asked all his photographers to read J. Russell Smith's North America. We were to read about the part of the country we were assigned to photograph. Smith was helpful, but if you just shot the topics in his book, you'd miss a lot. Looking at all the photographs I'd put in the file in Washington, I recognized two kinds. There were the documentary photos on Stryker's shooting script and the artistic photos. Stryker was no fool. He saw that the documentary photos would satisfy the bean counters in Congress and justify our existence. But the artistic shots were the real meat of the file. All of us knew that Stryker's goal was to create a national treasure. So he said, yeah, take the documentary shots, the rusted plows, silos, and dusty fields. But get the people. Get their faces. Get deep into America's heart. Until the government came up with the dough for a car, I relied on county agents to drive me around and take the photos on Stryker's shooting script. When I was in a big city, nothing excited me more than being on my own without a government escort. I loved walking the sidewalks with my little Leica. I had traveled very little until that time. I'd only been from my native Minnesota to Washington, D.C., and it was just great to be alone and paid to take pictures of whatever I liked. Every morning, I'd look at the map and go to a town just because I liked the sound of the name. Let me tell you my little story about North Platte, Nebraska. October 29th, 1938. North Platte, Nebraska, Friday night. Dear love of my life, last night I had an adventure where I got kind of plastered. But it was all in the line of duty, quite legitimate and justifiable. About eight o'clock, I walked into the corner saloon, a saloon in the grand tradition. The stink of ashtrays and spilled beer hung over the room. The floor near the bar was nasty and stuck to my shoes. I drank only beer, but great gobs of it. At the piano was a fat blonde woman named Mildred, of 45 to 50 years, with lovely, smeary red makeup on her puss, and huge mammy-type bosoms, and her voice. Oh, that you could hear that voice. Her piano was good honky-tonk, back-and-forth stuff. The customers fed her kitty and requested nasty songs she knew, one which was called, I Wish I Was a Fascinating Bitch, about a girl who wanted to be a prostitute, and another about her man, pretty double entendre and dirty. So I get the idea I'll photograph this gal, I gave her half a buck, that warmed her up, and asked her to sing Nobody's Sweetheart. Then I got chummy with her and had her calling me honey and asked about taking a picture. Of course, she'd be happy to. So I rush up to the hotel and get six flash bulbs, had more beer and took six pictures of her at the piano and of the leering boys at the bar listening to her racy songs. She took a personal interest in me and I fulfilled my lifelong ambition to sing in a saloon. You should have heard me. How good I was. Mildred told me all about the vices in Omaha. So I got a head start on my story about an Omaha prostitute. I got rooked a bit on dough, about three bucks I got rid of in the joint. But need I emphasize it was worth it? I should go back there tonight and get more facts from Mildred, go up to her room. She lives in the hotel next door and photograph her there with her wardrobe and her bureau drawers. Then I'm sure I'd have photos I could sell with a little story. I leave late tomorrow for Lincoln, and then on to Omaha, and I'd be so damn glad to get my mail from you. Love to you, Penny. John. After I mailed that letter, I realized I should not have told Penny about going to Mildred's hotel room. That was pretty stupid. What the hell was I thinking? Nothing ever came of it. No story, no sex. It was all on the up and up, but still... On a cold November morning in Omaha, walking the rail yard, I knew in one moment I was a photographer. All it took was one click of the shutter. Let me tell you how that happened. Surrounded by images everywhere, 
Jobless men sitting on the steps of flop houses, the tattoo parlor, and the city mission with its soup kitchen. I chose instead to leave downtown and follow the tracks to the rail yard. The sour smell of engine grease and cinders clung to my clothes. A young man rushed to hop a slow-moving freight. Then I saw my picture, a cement silo of pure sun-brushed columns rising behind an idle boxcar. Immediately, I felt a connection with Walker Evans in one supreme photographic moment. I had captured the shot that he would have taken. But just as quickly, my connection with Evans vanished. The silo and the freight car was not my shot. For the past year, I had religiously aped Evans and the other FSA photographers. But in Omaha, I found my own style. That morning, I got so excited I could barely hold a thought in my head. I knew from then on I would photograph only what pleased or astonished my eye, and only in the way I saw it. I knew what delighted me was not cement silos and freight cars, but emotion on a living human face. A few days before my photo in the rail yard, Two plainclothes cops stopped me on Kearney Street in Omaha and started talking without showing me their ID. I got pretty sore, and they pushed harder, saying they thought I answered a description. Once they saw I was from the government, they backed off, but the encounter made me wonder what the hell was I doing here anyway? What was the point of my photographing? But the Omaha rail yard had restored my confidence, and after a few days without a drink and sober enough to have an actual feeling... I felt the reality of the Great Depression sinking in. It was all so clear. The why was in those faces on the streets. Gloom reached in from everywhere. Men in three-piece suits without a dime in their pockets stood outside hotels, waited at bus stations, and queued for the soup kitchen. Traveling men like little Tommy Murphy and his companion Ed Kay on the road in search for work. I passed stores with no customers, flop houses, 15 cents a mattress. I held my breath against the odor of dirty men on South Douglas Street. But their eyes found and accused me, a costly camera around my neck, a clean shave and fresh clothes. When I snapped them, their faces hardened. What right did I have, the faces asked. With gratitude and guilt, I dropped a penny into a dirty palm careful not to touch and the kids those precious kids doing their bit all smiles for the photographer I knew now why I photographed them but to do my job well I had to kick the habit my drunken night in North Platte with the fat broad the sick hangovers all that had to stop there was so much I wanted to do with my life now that I knew there was a small piece of an artist left in me. I realized I couldn't be a Washington bureaucrat and still take good pictures. I had to be trustworthy. I had to know my job and be a better photographer. No more underexposed fuzzy negatives. But the technical side was not that hard. Hard was getting people to trust you. I felt this so strongly. If you're going to take a portrait, you first have to talk to people. Otherwise, as soon as you point your camera, they'll stiffen. So why did Tommy and Ed agree to a photo? I'll tell you why. I got to know them, ask their names, where they were headed. Where's the cheapest place in town to get a meal? One thing I learned on the streets of Omaha that carried me through to every place I went was simply this. No matter how poor people looked, they still had dignity. They were still human. By allowing the photograph, Tommy and Ed told me they could hold their heads up. They were not beat. A good photographer must build this rapport and quickly. I took lots of snapshots on Stryker's shooting list, but my best shots were the portraits.
Those kids I photographed with their mothers made me ache for my little Annie. I was on the road when she was born, and that made me feel even more like a crummy father. Now Penny was pregnant again. Looking back, I see my biggest torments were loneliness and the endless grind. Gone was the romance of my little adventure. Dreadful isolation, damnable, dusty, rutted roads, winter wind knifing across my face, a summer's filthy shirt clinging to my back, laboring for every breath in the blazing prairie heat. But I soldiered on. I did my duty. I got all those numbing photos on strikers' list. The town meetings, the farms, the industry. But I needed to move past all that and shoot my own photos. I knew I had something of value in me. Those portraits of the kids proved it. I just couldn't shake a maddening sense of failure. Why couldn't I hang on to my confidence? Was that why I drank so much? But my confidence and excitement returned when Stryker sent me to Chicago. Deep inside, I knew my home was the big city. Chicago was my chance. Chicago was my grand old toddling town. June 25th, 1941. Chicago, Illinois. Wednesday, 6.45 p.m. Dear Penny, two letters from you today. I love to get them. This morning, I slept until 9.30, walked with my Leica until noon. I walked to the bookstore and saw my pictures in some of the state guides. A magazine called Defense had the picture of my grain silos all over it. Very satisfying, although the photograph did nothing for me. And I went to the Art Institute. Quite carried away. All the Renoir, Van Gogh, Seurat, all seen many times. I enjoyed, but much more, really. I enjoyed a big exhibit of work by students. Oils, watercolors, posters, photographs, montages, things put together with cloth and newspapers. Everything was interesting and much more fun to see than the galleries of the masters. It's fun to have your own ideas. Start recognizing the work of two or three people as it appears in different rooms and in different media. Anyway... It's a very big show, and I'm going back, and you ought to see it. We should live in Chicago. Coming home every few months just won't do for us. This is no way to be married. Regards to you and Annie. Love to you. John. June 27, 1941, Chicago, Illinois. Thursday night, 9.30. Dear pregnant one, Tonight I'm the pitiable spectacle of a man rummaging through his smelly clothes looking to wash socks without holes. I'm very footsore from so much walking. I wish I was staying downtown because I walked there four times a day anyway. Stryker called tonight. He said some of my pictures were out of focus. Damn it. He hadn't even seen them. Somebody just told him. He also said he was hiring two new photographers for the FSA. This makes me feel pretty bad, as it means I've slipped into an even more inferior position. Looks like I'm going to be a junior photographer for a good long while. These new guys are coming in with ideas of their own. All I got is a bunch of formulas I learned over the last five years, several different ways to imitate. By the way, your letter today didn't help. You could at least have told me I have something to contribute to photography. You could have mentioned what a lasting contribution I've already made. As for you, when you finish up with this next baby, I wish you'd go to Helena Rubenstein. I want you to put on some class, like the Chicago dames up and down Michigan Avenue. Glamour, groomed, chic, not one careless in her appearance, babe, not one in 100. I've been trying to tell you for years you could do it, and now, by God, I'm going to make you do it. Your husband, John Vachon. The tension of my crumbling marriage and the fear that a few bad photos would get me fired were always on my mind. But walking the streets of Chicago improved my mood. In Chicago, I proved I was not just a portrait shooter. I could take photos of anyone, any place, and my photographs were good. After the war broke out, the FSA became the Office of War Information, and our pictures were used to make Americans feel good, 
and show we were ready for war. The Great Depression was easing because many now had jobs in the war industry. My job was to travel into the Midwest and Western states to show off our great country. But by that time, I was approaching 10,000 photos in Stryker's file and already knew our people made the country great. I didn't know it then, but I was having a last look at America as it used to be. And all those photos were there to remind us. As spring arrived, I crossed the continental divide and was the farthest west I'd ever been. Snow melted off the Rockies and early violets popped up in Pocatello. Everywhere was a delight of new things, the smell of fresh sheets snapping in the breeze on a clothesline, boys playing marbles, women with blackened hands planting victory gardens, and sunny blossoms clinging to apple trees like snow. There had been confusing and frustrating days when the click of a shutter seemed senseless to me, and I wondered what I was really doing and why. There was the hard-eyed rancher who said, Son, there's a war going on, and the government's sending you around taking pictures? Or the resentment of my A ration card allowing unlimited gasoline. As a result, I was pretty unsure of myself at times. But an overnight stay at a winter sheep camp or coffee and cake with the ladies of the church would always restore my confidence in the importance of what I was doing. 